It's time for class. Civics just doesn't begin and end on election day. This is Sunday Civics, the home for the civically engaged with political strategist L. Joy Williams on Sirius XM's Urban View. Welcome to Sunday Civics, the home for the civically engaged. I am your host, your civics teacher, and your neighborhood political strategist, L. Joy Williams, and I am so glad that you made it to class this morning. Today, we are on the eve of NAACP Founders Day, and I thought it was a great opportunity to bring the president and CEO of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People to the front of the class for a wide-ranging discussion on everything from a federal civil rights agenda under a new administration, the role of civil rights organizations in our communities and our continuing ongoing conversation about what accountability looks like. Now, how are we gonna fit all of that conversation into our time together? I don't know, but I'm certain um, my guests and I will do our best to try to do that. Welcome to Sunday Civics for the first time, Derek Johnson, president and CEO of the NAACP. Welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for inviting me to the show. I've always heard very good stuff about the show, and hopefully you can teach me a good civics lessons while I participate today. Well, yes, we have for a number of months been trying to get you on the show. Thankfully, <clears throat> I pulled some strings. <laughs> was finally able to get you on. So thank you very much. And we are on the eve of Founders Day, and we'll talk a bit about uh, that later and talk about our beloved organization. But since this is your first time, I'm going to ask you to tell us the story, like we ask all of our first-time guests, to tell us the story of your first civic action. Oh, uh, wow. So it, it, so I observed growing up in Detroit. It was fascinating because the mayor of the city of Detroit, Comey Young at the time, was the first African-American mayor. And he was very candid in his approach to governing and very candid in his response for those who were critical of the city of Detroit and particularly the African-American residents. So I was always intrigued with how he would manage uh, media conversations and interviews. And I can recall a time where there was a governor, a candidate for governor running for office and his whole campaign platform was he would be the governor to put uh, the mayor of the city of Detroit in his place. And it was fascinating because Coleman Young's response was to put every city vehicle uh, that had gas in it that could run on the streets would vote now signs on election day. So we had garbage trucks going down the street saying, go vote, go vote. And at the end of the election cycle, his announcement was, I am the mayor of the city of Detroit who sent that wannabe governor back to his, his, back to his home because he had never been a uh, governor as long as I'm the mayor of the city of Detroit. I was enthralled. That was about power. And when I got on campus at Tougaloo College, uh, there was a guy who was a justice court judge. It's in Mississippi. I went to school at HBCU in Mississippi. And the Supreme Court had removed him from the bench. And it was a struggle. And in the response, he ran his wife for a justice court judge. And he came on campus because we were one of the priests. And one of our professors told him to talk to me and a friend of mine. And he was very clear. I, uh, he said, Kirk, he told me to talk to you because I don't, I don't need little scared jokers. He didn't use the word joker, so you can imagine. And uh, if y'all ain't scared, then I need y'all to come because these folks ain't going to tell us what to do or who they elect. Like. And that was my first actual campaign organizing students on campus. I've been addicted ever since. I like that story of talking about power. And when you have that first demonstration, I think I, I can think about stories in my own career, in uh, my own organizing, and how people exert political power, how they exert power in their community. It definitely, you can have a number of different reactions. One, the like, did he really just, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, do, and then two, some people go the extreme and say, well, I want that kind of power, right? And then that's a whole, you know, a, a whole different trajectory. But then also thinking, at least it's been my experience, once you see that demonstration of power of like, how can we use that as our community? Yeah. How can we, you know, be powerful within our own community, which brings me to this quote that we often use within the NAACP, that the NAACP must be so strong in numbers and so effective in method that no one, no mayor, 
any city, no governor of any state, no congressman of any party or president of the United States, or even a foreign ambassador will dare to commit any indignity against people of color without realizing the NAACP will challenge them on the platform, in the press, in the courts, in the streets, and at the ballot box. I, I remember seeing that for the first time in an NAACP training. And again, thinking about the exertion of power, of how we exert power over our communities, over our own lives, and to actually uplift the people within our communities. What in the power that we hold as the NAACP, as the organization, what does that say to you? You know, it, it, self-determination is a key guiding principle of mine. Uh, it's key because I, I watched the Republic of New Africa remake itself and become the Malcolm X Grassroots Network. Shokwe Lumumba, also from Detroit, was in Mississippi, so I had an opportunity to just, at a, as a student spectator, watch that whole transformation as I learned the history. But also I was learning history of the civil rights veterans on the ground and understand that the civil rights movement, as displayed in media and some of our history books, is not a true account of what was experienced and the response to it. Self-determination puts in, in the power, the center of gravity in the individuals in the communities that are being injured and affected. And it tells those individuals that allow those individuals to know that we have the power, we have the agency, we have the ability to push back. And NAACP for me is a vehicle for voice. It is one of our many institutions and it's our vehicle to display our collective voice around a set of, of interests and political wills in ways in which we cannot allow ourselves to be compromised. And when we become uh, compromised, we must do some self-cleansing so no one dictate our agenda. We are bottom-up structure. We are informed by members who go to units and units who form opinions around our resolutions, who submit that to national, and they inform our policy priorities for a particular year or stage in, in our trajectory. 112 12 years old organization only existed for this long, not because we were a top-down model, but we're a bottom-up model. So how we look in Brooklyn is completely different than how we may look in, on Staten Island, which is different than how we look in Cleveland, which is different than how we look in Alabama. But the same set of principles guide us all because it's local communities being self-determined around what's in the best interest in their local community around the public and corporate policy that governs them. I think that's a really important point in making the distinction. There's two things that I use at talking about NAACP as a different organization. One, that bottom-up model, because quite often we get the question, why aren't you guys focusing on this issue or what, you know, focusing on this issue or, you know, I get the questions about you. Well, the president should be doing this. And I'm like, well, did we ask him to do that? <laughs> you know, and that it's not just a leader that unilaterally decides you as the president, also the board, that it, it comes from the people, as you mentioned, that are on the ground, even to image award nominations That's right. Right? of, you know, people are like, well, why didn't this get nominated? And I was just like, yeah, if you Did think you vote? membership <laughs> of the NAACP, it makes sense. The people that are nominated, right. in thinking about who the black folks are across the country, who are part of those units and how things rise to the top. How do you do that balance that there, yes, is things that come uh, primarily because of the structure of our organization from the bottom up, but then there are things that are happening across the board for our people in our communities that may have, may have not risen to that level from the bottom up, but we need a response. You know, you know, uh, critical thinking skills and the agility to recognize that things evolve. You got to love people, all people, and that uh, an expert is only a person who know a little bit more than someone else in a particular room. So that puts the power of expertise in the hands of every individual who are confronted with issues locally. And if you love people, you can hear people and sometimes and many times the best information in the gauge of what's local now and could be a national trend is from someone that's unassuming without the title, without 
the 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 exposure, educational exposure, but but the community activism a leader should always be defined by the person who's willing to do and push other people forward, not by the title. And if you're listening closely, my experience in the organization has been one in which some of the most profound movements or individuals who created movements were not the people with the, with the titles. And in many cases, it was the people with the titles who was trying to suffocate movement. And so me in this position, I'm always listening. I'm always uh, trying to be disciplined enough to have the agility to say, you know what? I thought it was this way, but let me kind of move and get over here because this makes sense. Not leading with ego, but leading with open ears and embracing people because you have to love people. Well, <clears throat> there is this conversation among organizers and you know folks like us, at least within my generation and younger that are talking about there's a difference between you know leaders who love black people and people who love them <laughs> just love themselves. Right. <laughs> you know, loving black people means you also you know, sometimes frustratingly so. <laughs> sometimes, you know, you shake your head and you're just like, my people, my people. Oh my you know, but, <laughs> <laughs> but if you're above of Black people, that sort of keeps you in sometimes very frustrating, you know, other, you know, other things. But that love is what keeps you in the fight and sort of keeps you engaged and not just... You know, <laughs> Going for, going for broke, but you know, your people can make it hard on you sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, I think you and I were in a meeting one time and I texted you, I said, well, don't we love our uncles and aunts? We gotta love them. <laughs> yes. but, 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 but that's a part of family that, that we, we shouldn't always agree because if we were a monolith in our opinion and thought and beliefs and approach, when we hit, we could hit big, but when we miss, we will miss awfully. It's that tension of, of people coming to the table with different perspective, different points of reference, uh, different experiences, and therefore having a different opinion. And you put that on the table and you let that friction come out. And out of that, my piece of solution matching with your piece of solution could be the solution, but recognize that none of us have all of the solutions. And it's in that love of people. Now, I'm younger than you, so I, I got what your generation is saying, but you know, this concept of egocentric leadership has failed us every time. Every time egocentric leadership failed us. Community-centric uh, leadership should always be the model because in that we get the best of all of who we are. But with the ego, what happens in that case is when the personality is no longer on the scene, people become idle, complacent, or looking for the, the next savior. It's a savior complex. Some of that is born, born in our religious beliefs and our training, but we miss that component of that those of us who practice in the Christian faith, not recognizing that all of us have Christ in us. We're not looking for the Christ outside of us. And if we recognize that we all have that within us, we stop looking at the ego, the individual, and, and see that we all have the ability, the capacities. I love the inspiration that Martin Luther King provided during that moment, but he was not the leader of the civil rights movement. He was a spokesperson. He was a profound speaker. He gave inspiration, but what did he do? What did he do? It wasn't a Montgomery uh, was boycott. That was Edie Nixon, the head of the NAACP, and Rosa Parks, the, the secretary at the time, who had been organizing people for years before Martin Luther King even come to town. And when they called, he was the third call. And when they asked him, he said, let me, let me, let me get back to you. What did he do? March of Washington, oh, that was A. Philip Randolph, in my opinion, one of the most effective of all the civil rights leaders, because he started in the 30s organizing workers to give workers their agency to collectively bargain, because we were brought here to be exploited for free and cheap labor and denied our ability to bargain for our labor. And he organized the Pullman Porters. And in that space, he also created a whole group of community organizers who will go across the landscape and help us spread the message and build movement. What did he do? He inspired, and that's beautiful, but we shouldn't be waiting for the next Martin Luther King. We should be 
I'm talking about the Ella Bakers of the world who was smart enough to get away from those chauvinists at the national NACP, go back to New York, come up with a concept and get young people. When she partnered with SEL, she said, no, y'all not gonna direct these young people. We're gonna empower these young people. That's why we get the student nine by the coordinating committee. And she was smart enough to say, wait a minute, there is a set of World War II veterans who are strategic. And I'm gonna send my young people to work with these elders because movements are intergenerational. It's not one generation. So you have the strategic, uh, and logistical of the, that generation of World War II veterans. They were middle age. You had the wisdom in the communities and you had the energy of those young people. It became combustible in a way in which we began to push resulting in the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So we always have to look at who the crisis in all of us. Egocentric movements kill us. It kills movement. It suffocate our talent. But community-centric movements allow us to grow and move forward. That's why I love the NAACP. It's not about the individual, it's about all of us. That's why I appreciate your leadership, Eljoy, in Brooklyn, because it's about all of us. And you know better than anyone else that you can be replaced tomorrow just like you replace somebody. But at the end of the day, we have to make sure that our voice, our vehicle vo vo our voice, that Brooklyn Branch NAACP is intact so folks can bring their grievance to the table. We can collectively pursue a course of action to remedy the grievance. I think <clears throat> I've heard you talk about egocentric leadership before and putting it, putting that, the, our history into that context because so much of not only internal question is well who's the leader and who's the who's the next leader but then externally right because the forces outside of our community are asking the question well who speaks for you you know and what what are y'all you know issues and when we come back from we're going to take a quick break when we come back from it i want to talk about the quote black agenda because part of me is like well, our agenda is the same as everybody else's, <laughs> you know, like in everything. And like who's the leader? Everything. Yes. Who's the leader? Yes. What's our agenda? Yes. Because it's all of us and it's everything. Right. So I want to talk a bit about that and particularly the differences of an agenda under uh, different aspects, even from a federal administration standpoint to, to local. But we're going to do a quick break and then we'll be back with more. Derek Johnson, president and CEO of the NAACP. <laughs> Welcome back to Sunday Civics. I'm Eljoy Williams. And at the front of the class with me is Derek Johnson, president and CEO of the NAACP on the eve of Founders Day uh, for the organization. And uh, we'll talk about that uh, shortly at the end. But just as we broke, we were talking about a quote, black agenda. And, you know, part of me, President Johnson is always offended when uh, people are asking me, well, what issues do Black people care about or what issues do the Black people in Brooklyn care about? I get this question a lot from elected officials or agency heads that, you know, want to have a conversation. And, you know, just as we broke where you said yes to everything, I say something similar. Um, I ask, well, you know, the other groups that you're, you're, you're meeting with, what did they say their agenda or what their issues were? well, people are focused on the economy. And I was like, yes, that for black folks, <laughs> you know, and people are focused on edu our education. Yes, that for black folks. So, you know, just really educating people that, you know, our interests and our agenda is wide ranging because as you mentioned, we're not a monolithic group in terms of what every, that there's one agenda that we are all, you know, seeking. It is wide ranging. We care about every issue, just like every other human being in this country. Now there is a, a racial lens on some of those issues that you need to be educated about, um, understand the inequities that exist, but Every issue you can think of, Black people have a view. It's part of our agenda. Absolutely. You know, our agenda are our dollars, and our tax dollars fund this, this governance system. And this governance system should reflect our tax dollars from top to bottom, inside out. So our agenda has everything to do with the Department of Defense, the Department of Agriculture. Our agenda has everything to do to the, with the local school uh, board, to a city council. 
The answer is yes, it is all of those things. And that's really important. But NAACP, we're an advocacy organization, not service provider. We advocate for public and private uh, policies that reflect the needs and interests of our communities, plural. And our communities are local, they're state, the rural, the urban, for NACP, we in 47 states. We have a branch in uh, uh, Honolulu, Hawaii, a brother who actually is from North Carolina, but Hawaii. We have branches in Alaska, Fairbanks, and Anchorage. We have branches in Connecticut. We have branches in Maine. We have branches in Florida and everywhere in between. Everything that impacts our lives is, is our agenda. Our agenda has everything to do with our, our spin, our consumerism. Our agenda has everything to do with how corporations impact our communities, whether they locate a plant or a job. It's all of those things. And we should not fall into this false narrative that we must have a specific agenda. When the uh, incoming, when the president was uh, incoming and we had a conversation with him, I said, I'm less concerned about people. I'm more concerned about policy priorities. And policy priority for me is a racial equity lens on everything you do. Therefore, there should be someone capping the level that report directly to you to ensure that all decisions have racial equity embedded in the DNA of that decision. Because those are our, that's our money, those are our tax dollars. It's not about people. Because we had a, the former head of HUD who came from our community, and he did more damage in civil rights protections out of HUD than the past five people combined. So it's not about uh, uh, whether someone comes from our community alone. It has everything to do. What are the policy priorities? Will it be a part of the DNA to remove the structural barriers or structural racism? Is it a part of the, the policy DNA to ensure we open up opportunities looking to the future? We have to look both towards the future as we repair the harms of the past. And since we, as you talk about that, that the Black agenda on the federal level, and particularly because we moved to another presidential administration that some say is more friendly, to uh, people of color, Black folks specifically, um, really just about relationships, just who he knows. <laughs> you know, people are uh, measuring that as being closer. Um, for a civil rights organization such as ours, and we are one of many now that exist, um, you know, talking specifically about how those policies are implemented, how do we learn from our past, as you mentioned, of not just having individuals in particular positions, but ensuring that they have the, the weight and the power, going back to our early mm -hmm. uh, conversation, to actually make structural change. Yeah, so, the, you know, the question is power, knowing that you have it and then figuring out how best to use it. There are so many people to ascend uh, into positions of title, but never assume the power of the position. And for the NAACP, we must push people to recognize and leverage their power. Don't give me a task force on criminal justice reform because it's been studied enough. Let's do something about it. That's about leveraging power, not allowing people to kick the conversation down the lane. Don't, don't talk about another study when something has been studied enough when you have the power to make the changes. The student debt crisis in the African-American community is looming. We don't need congressional activity when there are executive or administrative vehicles to address student, some of the student debt crisis for those who work for uh, a government, a city, state, and federal government, especially our teachers. We can't talk about improving quality education and getting more black teachers in a classroom if you underpay them and then they're stuck with debt. We have the power with this administration to make those changes. So power is the capacity to make things happen or prevent bad or prevent things from happening. It is our job to force people to use their power in our interest. Now, I, I want to switch gears a, a bit and um, talk about <laughs> the evolving role of the NAACP because you said something earlier that I say locally all the time that we're not a service based organization mm -hmm. and. That's served within the NAACP in many different forms. You know how the accomplishments of our past are often used as a measuring stick to our present. So for instance, 
Um, I, I give people, and in, in, earlier in this episode, um, I'm going to give a history a lesson about human rights law. So in New York, for instance, the human rights law didn't pass uh, until 1945, which at the time Thomas Dewey signed it into law. It was, we were the first state um, to uh, pass legislation and create an actual agency that would investigate and hold people accountable in terms of discrimination. That for a number of states, as you know, before that, that didn't exist. So the it only- It doesn't even exist in some states now, but go ahead. <laughs> right. So the only entity that either one existed to actually investigate cases or take something to court or follow up in, you know, in housing discrimination or employment discrimination was the local NAACP. Well, Absolutely. now- Fast forward, because of the advocacy of NAACP, Urban League, and others, we now have those state and local agencies. And as you mentioned, not everybody does, but, you know, state and local agencies. And so when we locally tell folks, did you file a complaint with the, you know, the uh, uh, human rights? Well, that's why I call the NAACP. Y'all don't even do nothing. And I'm like, but we... Uh, <laughs> you know, and sort of making that connection is just like we fought hard, yes, in our past to ensure that those things existed. We had to force government to create an entity in order to, you know, uh, prioritize a discrimination and to pro investigate and prosecute discrimination. That's a win. Yes. But now people use it against us as that. Like, well, then what do y'all do then if y'all not doing this? You know, it is is people are under stress and then they come to us to be their microwave when they then they realize that they never plugged us into the outlet to give us the energy to do the work they need us to do at the, in the moment without even knowing what has already been done or put in place to provide the support they are talking about you know you have the the the, the, the human rights agency in several states have it that was part of our advocacy during a 30-year period to put in place a governmental function with investigo investigatory power to it to to investigate and enforce certain parameters to protect us. Many people where I live here are going to get their COVID shot at a federally qualified uh, health clinic. What people don't know is those federally qualified health clinics that are that are across the country, NAACP created. It came out of Freedom Summer, and as a result of that. We begin to advocate for a federal appropriation for those health centers, just like we advocated and was successful in getting federal appropriation for Head Start. Now, we could have said, okay, these are not our health clinics. No, that's not what we do. We created the vehicle through policy so that people can have access to health care in these rural or isolated areas. Or so we created the policy so young kids can have a, a leg up, a Head Start in education. Those centers exist. Those are all things that we advocated for successfully and now they're in place. Our job is not to create a soup kitchen to feed people. Our job is to ensure their public policy so the soup kitchen no longer is needed because people have access to food. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's part of our responsibility to educate people about that process, right? And even within people that want are members of NAACP, are in leadership of NAACP in terms of committees, helping people to understand the difference between direct service or uh, a, a social service agency, or even just putting on events versus our advocacy role. I find that sometimes people have a difficulty grasping the difference. Yeah, I mean, we, we were created as advocates, as an advocacy organization. Urban League was created as a service provider. It's a big difference. And they do a good job at it, but that's not our work. It's a similar work. And, and Eljo, you and I both know there was a, a long period of time that in ACP, we fell into the trap of being just an event provider. We, we were known for giving a national convention and we come and do this event, do that event. That's not our role either. Events are the stopping place, should be the stopping place between the work. And the work is putting forth a, a, a path or a strategy to impact public policy, ensuring that our communities are civically engaged, making sure that the representation of, 
of our community reflect the values of our community, making sure our tax dollars or our consumerism reflects the, the, the value of our community. That's what we do. The events are just stopping points to kind of re-energize or share best practices or train or retool. The service are the, should be the outcome of our work, not our work. And so we have to grapple with that. And unfortunately, actually thinking out loud here, I'm glad you're doing the Sunday civics because we don't know the role of government. We don't know the role of our institutions in our community and how those things coalesce and complement, whether it's our black churches and denominations or non non denominational churches now, whether it's NACP or Urban League or or whatever local group, whether it's the 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 the, the governance of the borough or the city or the state, how all those things come together. And where do we find our agency to push those boulders in the direction we need them to go? That's what's beautiful about what you're doing with Sunday Civics. And unfortunately, far too many people either didn't take civics or wasn't taught in school any longer. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's important given, I, I do this in the tr tradition of Septima Clark, <laughs> you know, and others who understood that you have to, um, that it, Classism still exists, right? And I think even within civil rights organizations or in an organizing sense, we create this distinction of I'm civil rights leader, I'm you know leader in my community, <laughs> separate and apart from the folks again that we say we love in our community, right? Mm -hmm. And I always tell people that if you are organizing folks, it's to empower them to participate and make the decisions that they believe is in their best interest. Yeah. It's yeah. not just to organize people for what, for your will <laughs> and for what you yeah. think. And, well, and, well, Ella Baker quotes, strong people don't need strong leaders because they're the leaders themselves, right? You know, you and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned September Clark. If we have a real study around the, the voices, the philosophy behind our successful movement, uh, it wouldn't be the the, the household names. It, it would be the Byron Russians, the September Clarks, uh, and that's important to Corden Coxes of the world because it was those individuals who stepped back to push other people forward. And that's our role. How do we step back so we can push people forward? One of the uh, Chinese philosophers that I love, uh, uh, Tan Tzu, say uh, to lead the people, uh, walk behind them. That's our job to walk behind, not in front of, not to dictate, because when you're walking behind them, you can listen, you can see, you can identify how leadership moves forward. We have to remove the schisms within our community because that's self-harm. And we and we have committed so much self-harm around uh, genderism and, uh, and orientationism and ageism and all those isms, which is foolish because uh, our history have prove it over and over again, you, we cannot determine where the next great concept movement come from. Therefore, we should embrace all of who we are, all of who we are, and all the isms that we have inherited or we implement need to be removed. We're fighting a caste system. We don't need to create a caste system within a caste system. Therefore, we have to break both of those castes so that we can stand up the best of who we are, no matter how it shows up. I think um, there's a question um, that uh, comes to mind from um, our folks, uh, who, which you know we'll share later. Get to get the benefit of participating live in the conversation. Um, but the question is about speaking about race as a social construct. And we, yes, we know very well that, yes, it is a, a social construct similar to money and anything else, but it has real implications. How do we, you know, the, the difference between the esoteric intelligence, like what happens, you know, up here, as my uncle would say, you know, there's the esoteric that we could talk about up here, but then how things play out in our everyday lives. Yeah, you know, I, I remember being in law school and the brother came in, lawyer, Lou Myers. Lou, Lou had a unique career. I mean, he was general counsel at ACP at one point, Louis Farrakhan's general counsel, Jesse Jackson's general counsel, 
I mean, he was a revolutionary guy, really active with Republic of New Act Africa. And he was lecturing at our law school, but Bossa, he said, you know, law school is one of the most unique places he had ever experienced because other people outside of our community can write creatures on the board and we begin to question our own intelligence. Those creatures are A, B, C, D, or F. They say that's it's the most asinine thing in the world. And what happens in that with some of us happen to be able to navigate through the maze that they put us through just to get credential or a title, we begin to lord over others who don't have titles creating one of those schisms. And so we begin to talk in esoteric terms as, as you're speaking of, or I like to say we, we, we create more armchair revolutionaries about what should happen and how the theory of change should take place. And we overlook the people who are in the midst of the struggle and have the solution. They are the experts. And that's why you gotta love people to get away, get away from the title, get away from the credentials because the expertise are on the ground. It's the people. People who are most impacted by the injury, they have the solution. It is our job to work hard to push those solutions forward and empower them so they can see they are the saviors they've been looking for. As we're talking about, um, which I'm sure you get this question a lot because I get it a lot, not only from folks outside of the organization, but even, you know, I like to pride that Brooklyn branch where I lead is one of the most intergenerational branches. Um, and I think that's important, right? Because you know, our communities are intergenerational. And so our the organizations within our communities need to reflect that fact. There has to be um, this balance. And, you know, when we have issues such as reimagining public safety, right, you get to hear from all different aspects in our community, some who are like, yep, let's all the way from let's abolish the police to, you know, no, we need police. We just don't want them to kill us. Right. So like there's a, a, a range of um, views and experiences that people have. And, you know, that police brutality and law enforcement accountability is one of those things that has been ever present in our history as an organization in, in tackling. Um, what in your view, because that is something that not only on the ground, but also nationally is this national conversation of reimagining public safety. Um, how are you tackling that as leadership? Well, you know, we must never allow the phrase drive the conversation as opposed to dealing with the conditions that created the needs for the phrase to start with. So always start there because you can imagine what what happened in the 60s when black power became the phrase and how it then was inverted and used against us. Or stop the police are not being inverted and used against us. Or you, you name uh, a Black Lives Matter being inverted and used against us. All of those phrases were a reaction to conditions that caused people to begin to drive home the question of change. Black power was in response to understanding that we actually have agency. We are human beings and should be respected with dignity. In addition to that, we are full citizens and in, right, entitled to all the rights and privileges this nation provides because it's our tax dollars funding it. We don't get the tax break. So we are paying per capita or, or our fair, greater than our fair share in many cases. That the whole question of, of Black Lives Matter is in, in a response to the reckless behavior of law enforcement agencies disregarding our human selves in ways in which they felt it was okay, gave license for them to uh, convict and punish on the spot. And ACP was created out of that same reality as a result of a race riot in Springfield, Illinois, and, and groups coming together because people felt that they can be judge, jury, and executioner on the spot with the lynching. And when you look at what happened in Minneapolis and, and the whole reaction to that, what had always been an undercurrent became the, the defund police. And as opposed to looking at the conditions that created the phrase in the first place, the whole concept is a distraction. And for those of us who are 
in this space, we always, we must be mindful how phrases can be inverted and used against us and, and taking us away from the underlying conditions. Policing in this nation is a problem. It has been a problem for a while in our communities and it show up in multiple ways. In Baltimore, you have an agency that a large number of the law enforcement officers live outside of the city. They didn't, they didn't grow up in Baltimore. They have no affinity for the city. So when what they do on, while they're on duty, it has no relationship to the quality of their life and their homes. Therefore, there's a level of disregard. They gotta be addressed. In places like Ferguson and these midtowns, they have used a predatory policing model to fund the city through through fees and fines. We gotta change that model. People shouldn't be preyed on. And then they go, then they take it from there and buy up surplus military gear as if they're about to go to war with the very citizens that occupy the city. In Minneapolis, in, Minneapolis, in, in far too many cities, the a police fraternal order in New York, they dictate the terms of relationship with the city as opposed to the city dictating the terms of relationship with the community. Those are all true issues. And when everything is said and done, the, 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 the lobby wing of, of all of this have determined that we must increase police budgets because that's how we generate money. And then we cut in other areas. If a community is in distress, you need to increase funding for social workers. If you have a high concentration of those who have mental illness of any sort, you need to increase funding for mental health providers. If you have a high incidence of domestic violence because of job loss and other stressors of the home, you need to increase the funding or provide training for those who can manage domestic violence scenarios. Not cut those budgets and give it to the police force and not train them to de-escalate when they run to scenarios of community trauma, of household trauma, of family trauma, or mental health uh, illness. So we should never get caught up in the phraseology, but recognize there are underlying set of conditions that created the phraseology. Therefore, that's the conversation I wanna have. I'm not gonna get stuck on a defund the police debate. That's foolhardy. Well, on that, we're going to take our final break. And then when we come back, we'll talk about how our beloved organization um, is evolving to increase um, our power and increase our organizing prowess to ensure that our communities uh, get the resources and the respect that we deserve. We'll be right back with more Sunday Civics. <laughs> Welcome back to Sunday Civics. I um, have been having a great time <laughs> in this conversation with our guest, the president and CEO of the NAACP, Derek Johnson. I feel like we can go on the road. We can um, <laughs> like have these conversations in different aspects. I, I like talking to friends and colleagues and others and um, I like having the intellectual esoteric conversation and also the brass, you know, like what's actually yeah. happening in our communities. I think both um, are necessary. But uh, as you mentioned, our folks live real lives and real communities with real issues every day. Um, and that's why uh, part of why we exist. We are on the eve of Founders Day uh, for NAACP, which we celebrate the uh, founding of the organization um, and take a moment to learn our history, reassess where we are, and make decisions on what we're going to do, how we may uh, shift. And this organization has shifted many times. Um, and there have, just as our communities have shifted over time in terms of what our uh, priority uh, for our communities, how um, under your leadership and under the current board's leadership is the organization expanding and growing our membership um, in this new, new age? Good question. You know, uh, a lot of that is through individuals like you, leadership that are innovative on the ground. One of the most uh, important things that I recognized when I was a state president is the connective tissue of understanding electoral politics and being in the game. Anytime we have leaders that are so positioned and, and they head up the local branch or state conference, I know we have an opportunity to have an impact. Secondly, 
the average age of African American is mid thirties. It is our goal is to push the average age of the organization down to mid thirties, but recognizing that we as an organization, we're like a double hump Campbell. And there's a reason for that. 99.9% .9 of all of NACP is volunteer driven. There's a very small staff compared to the size of the organization. And, and as a result, we have young people, middle high school, who parents and grandparents bring them and they get engaged in youth council. Then some of them will go on and pick up new friends in college chapters. But at age 25, you see a drop off because life hit. They're not subsidized by parents and grandparents. They're not subsidized by school. It's not one of the, the, the clubs on the campus. And then we, we lose a large number of people and they start coming back around 50, 55, 60, because it's at that age they have disposable time, disposable uh, resources to really engage and they see the value of the uh, NACP as a vehicle for voice. But in that valley is where the majority population of African American exists, mid thirties. And so under my uh, tenure, my goal is to push that average age down by opening up many ways for people to plug in, recognizing as life hit, they have jobs, families, mortgages, uh, and other obligations, and doing it in a way is more user-friendly. What you have created there in Brooklyn and uh, Coastal created in D.C. and Daniela created in Cleveland and, and Camilla created in Detroit is a part of the ingredients because you need people to reflect what you're pursuing. And they need to see themselves as active participants up and down the opportunity scale of volunteerism. And that's really important. We have a way, a much more robust social media game. We didn't have any game. It was, it was dormant to say the best. Uh, and it's organization based and not individual based. Uh, uh, on top of that, uh, there was some internal structure fixes we had to do. Uh, those fixes are moving along, along with our vice chair, Campbell Watkins Town, and the chair, Leon Russell. We have restructured the board so it can be more agile and reflective of what, where we're trying to go. As we also are retooling our structures internal, and it is a frustrating process. And you, you, you on, you're end user, you know, when you walk in the door, you see all this paper. It's like, why is all this paper here? There is this thing called technology. <laughs> you should be able to do this. Oh there. my God! <laughs> you know, it, it, every it, time yeah. we put a convention, I was just like, "Really? We just gonna just gonna yes, trees? yes." <laughs> and it was and it was frustrating. Okay, we dedicated the resource, we get in there, and it takes so long to get it up and functioning because you know technology is a business. It's a game. If you ain't if you don't do it right, it takes time. But there is so much, and. You know, Joel, you you learn at the board meeting. I'm not, I'm I'm usurping the chair. Our goal is to push everybody on the platform as we continue to fix the platform, and and do a revenue share that's 50/50, not 60/40. That if you get on the platform, then it's 50/50, because then that reduces everybody's headache, and we can help grow local units at the same time. You know, so there are a lot of things that were needed. There was some, you know, I didn't even know what I didn't know when I walked in the door, but I'm thankful for you and many others who are committed enough to support this vehicle for voice because under our stewardship, we need to leave it to the next set of individuals who are going to be stewards so we can continue this train for another 112 years if needed. If needed. Yes, definitely. You know, the last question I have, and then, you know, we, we certainly can talk for a long time, but I've been um, uh, for, since the beginning of the year talking about uh, accountability and saying uh, accountability is love. I have to love you in order to hold you accountable. So I use that. Um, mm -hmm. Talked about that as it pertains to uh, now Vice President Kamala Harris. Right, of holding uh, individuals accountable for the positions that they ascend to. Um, so holding you accountable um, both uh, uh, internally, you know, among family, but then also publicly, if need be, is part of how we love each other. It is important for that. Um, so it's a, a, a common theme I'm talking about this year. And so as we're talking about NAACP as an organization who loves Black people, who organizes and engage with Black people, how do you think we should hold NAACP accountable? Just by that, if we say we're going to do something, hold us accountable to it. Uh, you know, it, it is a poor steward 
to fear criticism. And criticism is healthy. It is not a bad thing, especially if the criticism is rooted in love, because if it's rooted in love, you're trying to get to a solution. You're not criticizing for the sake of criticizing. It frustrates me to know when people say, well, how dare you say that? No, we, we're, we are a living entity. We're not perfect. And so, and you brought it to me like, why are we doing this? This won't make any sense. You know what? You're right. So accountability is a two-way street, not a one-way street. And so when we're not living up to our potential, out of love, criticize, but use the, uh, the voice that you have or the, or the avenues to get it to the right place because criticism for the sake of criticism is a waste of time. There's a set of individuals, and I won't tell you how they disposition, they criticize and criticize. And I said, oh, that makes sense to me. And we fixed it. They still criticize it, but it's just on something else. So I'm like, wait a minute now, are you, are you in that space, that sunken place, because that's all you know? Because we, as a community, we have perfected the art of analyzing a problem. We have not perfected the art of implementing a solution. Mm. <laughs> oh yeah, we can sit on the porch and tell you why, why you wrong, why you ain't never been, <laughs> why you ain't never been right. <laughs> but then you say, okay, mama, I'm gonna fix it, and then go fix it, and just like, mm. <laughs> about, <laughs> you know, about time. You should have did it earlier. <laughs> I don't know why you wait so long to do it. <laughs> I've been telling you all your life. It was like, and what? Like, and again, sometimes you say, well, just, just bring it in. Let's hug. Just bring it in. Ain't nothing else I can do. Just bring it in. <laughs> well, I so appreciate you for taking um, the time um, to, to talk with us and being part of the discussion, being part of the uh, civics piece. Civ uh, civil rights organizations are part of our civic discourse. They are one of the tools and actually... If you still have your American government textbook, I have a number of them here in my office, but you will see that civil rights organizations and organizations outside the structure of a government are present in those textbooks, mm -hmm. just like the press is, right? Because these are entities that are about holding government accountable. It's even political scientists and historians and others understand the role that civil rights organizations play in our overall society. It is about agitating. It is about sitting on a porch and telling the government, you ain't right and never going to be right until <laughs> like, until you implement this. That's how we get human rights, human rights agencies. It's how we get policies that address inequities across the country. And so civil rights organizations are part um, of that infrastructure of how we voice our collective opinion also voice our demands and use our collective power in community to make civic change. So thank you, President Derek Johnson, for joining us. Well, I, I, I'm surprised you didn't ask me about the Wheaties box. Like, why he got a Wheaties box sitting on there? <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> so I, I see, I, I peeped it during your, during your conversation. I was also looking at your bookcase. You know, there, well, but it's in a case. Oh, my. Yeah, well, it's Tommy Smith, 6 8 Olympic, Black Power Fist. Okay. And so we were able to get them to do this commemorative piece. So all of the sale of Wheaties for this one goes to NAACP. Just, but I'm surprised you didn't say anything about it. But the oh, book shelf, oh, yeah. I'm always looking at the books to see what, <laughs> what what's, what's on the thing. Uh, have you read Cass? I, yes, I have. Yes, I have. I have that one. Actually, if you see this stack behind me, those okay. are all the books for the quarter that I because I, I, I do about 20 books a quarter that I order and read through. So that's all. That's all. For the quarter. Text text me the list because uh, for our leadership institute that we created, some of the books are there. So, yeah, we could we could trace the book times. I love to do that. OK, no problem. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. So much.